This is Tyrese Halliburton, and you're listening to Setting the Pace. Pacer Nation, welcome back. We are here with Coach David Thorpe of True Hoop. He joined us last year, and we had a great time talking with Coach Thorpe. So, Coach, uh, thanks for coming back on. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a great time of year to be a basketball coach and a basketball fan and an analyst between uh, mostly pro guys. But uh, I do I have some college guys that I help, too. So I got four guys in the tournament. And okay. a lot of coaching friends, so I'll be. I'm very busy this week. Absolutely, and we we've got a fun Pacers team here this season. That's really trying to take that next step from being a lottery team to making the playoffs. And it looks like they're going to make that. They've had a, a lot of roster changes this year, but you were in the building for Pacers Nets, and, and you know that was a, a pretty good showing by the Pacers defensively. I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, uh, your early thoughts on what this team has looked like since they acquired Pascal Siakam. You know, it's really been a, a bit of an unfair look because tonight, notwithstanding, uh, Tyrese just hasn't been Tyrese. He's just been a dude. But the Tyrese was magical before he hurt his hamstring, really. just a, He was having a magical season, I thought. And that guy with Siakam, Nemhard in the starting lineup, you know, Neesmith kind of solidified as the three. Well, I, I thought that group with the bench they have would be terrific. And we just really haven't seen it. I'm not even – tonight doesn't count. They beat the Pistons. <laughs> you know, we uh, uh, I, I, I'm rooting for Tyrese. I'm a, a huge, huge fan of his. Uh, and um, I think that if he gets himself going, uh, I think they can be a very dynamic team. Um, and I think Pascal was probably the best player they could possibly acquire uh, via trade or even free agency. So I think that was a smart move by them. Just sticking on the, the Tyrese injury situation. I mean, obviously it started physical. It was the hamstring issue. And I think a lot of it also became a bit mental. Of just he's taken on a lot this season. He's he's blossomed on the scene as a star, super busy during All-Star break, you know, kind of rushing back, trying to – he's got the All-NBA money hanging over his head, about $50 million on the line if he can make All-NBA or not. How much of his situation right now do you think is physical versus mental? Well, so I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, I'm not a doctor. And a lot of a lot of people in the media, of which I have a media company in True Hoop, uh, people pretend that they have no effing idea what they're talking about. So I wouldn't begin to tell you how much is physical. I know what people are telling me, but they're not the doctors either. So uh, it looks like he's moving okay, not amazing. I thought tonight was the best I've seen him get by people Agreed. but again it was Detroit so mm. I thought those guys stopped competing whereas Indiana kind of sped sped up their mojo Detroit was like ah we're done with this it's not fun to play against Indiana especially when you have nothing to play for I've talked to players around the league it is not fun playing at the pace the Pacers typically play so but I don't think you're wrong at all that uh I mean I think the point you made about the contract's a big deal it is it's just life generational changing money in addition to the money he's already guaranteed yes. to make with his contract. Uh, I, he's worn down. He's been injured. I don't think he's ever played more than 56 games in his career. Uh, yeah. So that's a factor. Um, I will tell you, you don't have to have any of those things existing, guys, to get in slumps. Like One of the reasons why I have a business is I help players get through rough weeks, games, months, or a month, hopefully, we don't, we don't want the last two months. <laughs> it's a, there's a lot going on in their, in their brains. And well, I thought Tyrese was great talking about the whole gambling thing. We just heard Bickerstaff talking about that issue with you know, death threats for him or weird phone calls and texts anyway. Yeah, there's a lot on these players' minds. And uh, I don't know that I agree with how Tyrese is trying to solve the problem, uh, which is just keep chucking it and hope for the best. Um, he kind of said that today before the game, I thought. But um, uh, it's it's absolutely changed. I mean, he's just not the same player. Let's hope, if you're a Pacers fan, that tonight is the beginning of a, a reemergence because he's just a, a really spectacular, charismatic player when he's going. He's talked a lot about how this team has changed since they did trade Buddy Hill to the trade deadline and how it does kind of hurt the spacing a little bit for what the offense could have been. But I'm, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on – how you've seen the offense change since Buddy Hill left and was dealt to Philadelphia. And if there's a way the Pacers can kind of not maybe fix that issue, but can kind of maybe 
replicated a little bit with who else they have on the roster. It's my, I'm sure it's changed. I mean, they brought in an elite scorer that doesn't really take bad shots very much in Pascal. And, um, but he needs the ball some to score. You know, he does want to play with it some. Uh, mostly it's changed because Tyrese has pretty much been terrible for a long stretch with some exceptions. And that's a gigantic, enormous contrast for what he was doing when he was playing the way he's been playing more or less for a couple of seasons. So um, I think that they've added a real weapon that, that has more of an arsenal, a larger arsenal than what Buddy had. I don't think it's a spacing issue at all. I think there is a, a bit of an issue in both ne Neesmith and uh, Miles. I think it felt like, well, you know, we just brought in a guy that's going to be paid a bunch of money. He's going to shoot. We're going to get our shots too. I I think both of them have been thirsty too much in games. Not every game, not every possession. But both those guys, I thought, had a tighter role, a tighter role. Neesmith was catch shoot, which is, I mean, shoot that all. If they don't guard you, shoot it every time. Amazing shooter. Super proud of what he's accomplished. Or a straight line drive dunk or finish strong. When he starts playing with the ball, I just to me, he's just not good enough for that, uh, uh, for what this team can be. They don't, they don't need him to do that. They've got other weapons they can use. And Miles can't wait to shoot it every time he gets it. And, and maybe he's thinking about his contract situation up next season. Uh, uh, recognizing this is what happens a lot when you bring in a player and people kind of know he's going to get a big contract. They start worrying about their dollars. This is part of the NBA experience. So I think I think they need a firmer hand, uh, starting with Tyrese and Pascal, really kind of demanding in the postseason. We've got to do a better job of our best players taking the best shots or at least controlling possessions. And then if, if you guys are wide open for a straight line drive or a catch and shoot three in the last five, six games of the clock, great. Um, and so uh, I think their offense can be spectacular, guys. Again, I also think their defense is much better. And we probably should talk about that at some point. It seems pretty clear. Uh, it, it's not just Detroit or Brooklyn last, you know, this weekend. It was OKC and Orlando. Like, they're showing signs of being average, which is what Denver did last year for much of the end of the season with their amazing offense. Of course, they had Jokic. But Tyrese is Denver's Jokic. If he can be that kind of offensive player and the team can be an average defensive team, which I do think is possible, they become a much more interesting team in the postseason. And that, that's it's a great point that, you know, I wanted to eventually make my way to, but I think this is the perfect time to be able to do it, is the Pacers were scoring at a historic rate for the, a large part of you know, the first half of the season. But everybody felt that it wasn't sustainable because come playoff time, if you can't get stops, you're not going to be able to get wins. And it's not realistic for this team to score 140 points a night and but give up maybe, you know, 135 or so. We've now seen the Pacers scoring. It has come down. But defensively, month after month, they've also let up about four to five less points per game than the previous month. Starting at in November, they were giving up 128 points per game. Right now, in March, they're giving up about 112 points per game. You know, does it feel that, hey, you could sacrifice on the offensive side because you got to get stops against the elite teams in this NBA? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that we we can't uh, – listen, guys, I, I, I've done this for a long time. I've coached a lot of amazing players, and I've been analyzing the games in, in the NBA since 2007. So I've seen, I've seen this, this kind of circus before. We, we, it's easy to get our, to take our eyes off the ball, so to speak. All right? The ball is Tyrese Halliburton, guys. If, if, if Tyrese Halliburton can find the player that he was, and there's no reason why he can't uh, in terms of – uh, I, I, as long as he's healthy. Like, it, it wasn't a flash in the pan. He didn't do it for two weeks or even just two months. The, I have no idea how good their offense can be. And so if he can get back to that, their offense, I think, can be incredibly potent. And they'll be better on defense, not because of Tyrese, although I have noticed in competitive games, because you know, tonight wasn't so competitive, I think he's trying more on defense. He's and I better. give him credit, knowing that his offense has been so bad, He's competing more in defense. He is a competitive guy. He, he's all about winning, I think. I really – I'm a huge fan of that part of his game. Is He's not just a charismatic, stylish guy. He, he wants to win. But, uh, listen, Nemar's in the starting lineup for a reason. His name isn't Ben Matherin, who can't really guard, doesn't want to guard, you know, fill in the blank. 
but he's you know he's an elite defender. Nemhard is in only his second season. I'm actually writing about five guys that I think all under 25. I'm publishing on Troop tomorrow that I think have all star, all a defensive potential, uh, or even better than that. Like Jabari Smith Jr. is one of the guys I'm looking at. But Andrew Nemhard is one of the guys we're writing about because of what he's done defensively. And even tonight, uh, uh, Kate Cunningham was cooking in the first half. He was giving Nemhard more problems than like Shea Gilgis and Booker gave him in Phoenix. But uh, they were tough shots. And in the second half, they just, he missed 10 in a row. Uh, I believe that was the number, 10 in a row. Uh, Andrew was very hard to guard. And then Siakam came in with bad defensive habits, in my opinion, in Toronto, where they switch everything and have for years. And quite frankly, they just haven't uh, – I think someone called it a soul tax. I think Caitlin Cooper called it a soul tax when you're just stuck on a bad franchise. All of a sudden, he's – you know, now he's on a team that's trying to compete for a top six seed. And Siakam's defense has gotten better and better. Uh, I think that's – and Neesmith, I think, is a solid defender. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they could be an average defensive team, and their offense shouldn't suffer when Tyrese gets back to being the, the guy we know he is. Yeah, you talk about Benedict Mather, and this is a guy that's really interesting because he has really just, in my opinion, had an up-and-down second season. And you've seen those flashes of really good defense, but then you've also seen a lot of – he gets caught ball watching, isn't that great defender? Now he's out with the shoulder injury. How different does this make the Pacers look without Matherin in the in the rotation? Oh, oh, oh they're much better. I think they're I mean, better. Let's just it. they're, they're, it's not even close. They, they were much worse when Ben Matherin was on the court. That doesn't that doesn't anything alarming. He's a young second year player. Uh, Kevin Durant uh, was a second year player for OKC. That was the first year they went to OKC, and they were better when he was off the court. They were worse when he was on the court. So at most, I think there's three second-year players right now whose teams are better when uh, when they're on the court. One of them isn't Paolo Bancaro, by the way. One of them is Andrew Nemhart. Another is Keegan Murray. And the third one is Jalen Williams, who's the best second-year player in terms of on-court, off-court kind of stuff. Uh, everyone else is your, – your team's better off when you're out. So uh, uh, between Ben's shot selection – uh, and his just inability to guard consistently because it's been pretty horrific. They're just they're just better when he's out. Now, does he have potential? Of course. I've always seen him as a sixth man, Norman Powell, go get buckets guy. I don't think he sees himself that way. That's a whole separate conversation to have. But he ain't playing now. I don't think he's back this year. So I think they're better. And I'm a huge fan of Ben Shepard. I, I don't know if ultimately he'll make it. It, uh, it like a lot of players like him. You got to be able to make threes at a you know thirty five percent plus rate. He doesn't take bad shots. He doesn't dribble the ball too much, and he really tries hard. He's not good at it yet, but he competes. That's a big step in the right direction. And so uh, I think he's got a chance, as well as Jarris Walker, who I was I had him in my top eight in in, the, in my, kind of when I evaluated all the draft guys last summer. Uh, he and I didn't realize though he's probably a three. So he, I really think, not that you guys are asking me down the road, but but I get asked all the time about down the road what the Pacers might look like. I think he's your starting three in two years when you're competing uh, in the East for something super special. If he can do that, he he gives them something really interesting. And you got a small ball lineup with Siakam at five and Jarris at four with his length and athleticism and feel for shot blocking. But he's a long way from that now. So I think both those guys can play some three. Uh, uh, they'll have to figure out what they're going to do with TJ. I think I think it makes sense to move him and get a real player in the offseason. Um, he's done incredibly well. But you guys said something about, I think uh, 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 Michael talked about um, the how, how, how likely is it they can depend on that offense in the postseason without defense. And I think the answer is, yeah, not very. The teams can really lock in. Um, and in the first round, there is more days between games, which helps it. We all know how bad Indiana has been on back-to-backs. I think that's a pace issue as much as anything else. At least in the first round, there's more days in between. So there's some recovery period there. And by the way, their opponents have to go through that too. So actually could play in Indiana's advantage a little bit. But it's, it's demoralizing to just not get stops. And they're, I think they're – I just looked it up. I think they're 17th now in like the last uh, you know, 10 games – and defensive uh, EPM, uh, earn, uh, estimated plus minus on ducksandthrees.com, which is what I normally use to evaluate it with metrics. 
They were like 27, 28, 29th most of the season. So, and they played some good teams in that stretch. So they've they've made some progress. They have a long way to go, but uh, I do think that uh, they are not a team that, that that I think can necessarily be counted on to lose in the first round just because they're kind of new because of that style of play. And they've got three playmakers with Neymar being the third, um, and one of them, well, two of them are really dynamic in Pascal and, and Tyrese. Yeah, I think there's a lot to like about this team. Even if, even if they have gotten away from their identity of being, you know, all about, you know, an offensive team, I think they needed to sacrifice a little bit of that to improve on the defensive side. But I really liked what you said about Ben Shepard, kind of versus Jarris Walker. Both are very promising players, but we saw that Ben Shepard, while picked far later in the first round, he had that experience coming out of college. This is a four-year player. And another guy that you mentioned before, Andrew Nembhard, another four-year player. Do you think the NBA is, is overlooking some of those players? Because we're seeing Jaime Hawkes Jr. coming for the Heat, another guy that was four years in college, really being able to produce. Ben Shepard, I feel like there was low expectations uh, coming into the season of would he even be able to get playing time. Now he's really been part of this rotation, and there's been a lot to like. So do you think the NBA will ever get back to valuing maybe four-year players a little bit more? Well, I, I wouldn't speak of the NBA as a monolith. You've got sure. 30 competing franchises. Uh, uh, there's at least one or two players in the draft this year that is likely to be a lottery, top 15, top 20, that are 22, 23. I think I read one is 24. That's not normal. No. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the young man from Tennessee who's a probably lottery pick, I think is 22, 23. I don't follow the, the draft too closely just yet. We're just in March. When we get through the NCAA tournament, I'll start locking it into the draft in June. But um, I think the smarter teams, I've always believed, number one, I've always believed trade down, trade down, trade down, unless you unless you, you have that golden ticket in, in a spot, as obviously there's sometimes that is the case. But uh, most of these players are much more similar than people realize. It's just how long have they been you know, playing college or in some cases international. But uh, I don't think college has any monopoly on player development. They don't. I think many NBA teams really struggle with player development. And it comes at a cost because you just lose. If you play that guy, you lose. The G League is supposed to be an answer. It's not handled well. As someone who has players in the G League, some of them are really happy with their coaching and the overall structure. Some of them feel like, I just can't believe it's professional basketball. It's embarrassing. And, um, and so those teams don't really take advantage of it very well. Those teams are probably better off drafting a, a player with some experience in college uh, because they've gone through lots of hours of shell defense and pick and roll coverages and all the things that colleges will do that some of these, you know, we can see in the G League, a lot of these players coming out of the G League Ignite are not ready to play. Uh, uh, they may be used to good training uh, and and plenty of reps and all that, but they don't really have a good foundation of how this game is played. Uh, I think you're going to see a change in, in the G League Ignite, for example, because of that. And they might get rid of it, I think. They're talking about it. And with NIL money, I think guys will stay in college more. And probably you'll see a case where the most talented players come out and we give them a lot of rope to learn. And then the other guys will, will stay in school an extra year long because they'll make two, three, four hundred thousand dollars And the NBA will get just a more, a more ready player to understand how to win. Just remember this, guys, when it comes to the draft. It's always been – it's never been about are they ready for the NBA. It's absurd. They're ne they almost never are. Almost no rookies ever. Chet, Chet probably was last year. Victor clearly is now. Those are unicorns. Almost never. It's about, is the NBA ready to draft you? Have they seen you enough? Have they gone enough practices and watched enough film and talked to all these people? And so I think if they stay in college longer, uh, if they're at a good program, they'll benefit a lot more and be more ready to help an NBA team sooner. Uh, and clearly, as Ben's proven, I mean, the Pacers play fast. The decision making is quick. He played at Belmont, and he's doing just fine. I would say Dame Lillard, didn't go to a big time school. He seems to be doing okay. So um, I think we'll see uh, uh, more teams recognize don't punish a kid because he's 21, 22 before he comes out. If he's going to be really good, he's going to be really good. It shouldn't matter if he stays in school or not. I, I wanted to go back to, to the Andrew Nimhart conversation because, you know, you talked about how good he is defensively, how he's going to be one of your top five players you're talking about in your upcoming article. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of frustration I've seen from fans this year with, Nimhard's overall play and I think sometimes if you look at a box score it might not be the sexiest thing and he was kind of you know labeled as the backup point guard this year and that kind of transitioned to, into him starting now next to Tyrese and so 
maybe I know we talked before last year when you when you brought up how he reminds you a little bit of Drew Holiday. Uh, I'm just curious what you've seen from Andrew in year two besides uh, just growing defensively and other ways he's really kind of solidified himself as a starter for a playoff team. I mean, two years in a row, we beat out two different lottery picks. Chris Duarte is not even on the team anymore. I don't know if he's playing NBA basketball anymore. I don't know where Chris is. I know he went to Sacramento. Yeah. But I, don't, I haven't seen him play much. Um, not in that, not recently anyway. And then Duarte got hurt, of course. Uh, and, but when he came back, he couldn't beat Andrew out. And he beat Matherin out two years in a row. This year, they gave it to Matherin. And it helped that Andrew was was coming, I think, a kidney stone to start the year and had some injuries. But it, it was Matherin's job to, to lose in my opinion, probably politically so. Like, I think his agents complain, how are you letting a second-round pick, who's a point guard, take our guy's spot? And they gave Ben plenty of rope, and he just hung himself. He just, he just can't guard. Again, who knows what the future holds? But uh, listen, my, I get my people are true upset with me when I say I don't really care what fans think. Uh, I really care what coaches think. If they're the ones paying attention. Uh, uh, you can't start a bad defensive player at two when Tyrese Halliburton's your one. Not, not in the NBA. You can play in a different league and do it, maybe in the ACB or something. But in this league, to have two got backcourt guys that can't guard, you can't, can't win that way. They, they tried that, and they were 30th or 29th in defense. So you're talking about an elite defender who is having to really adjust because he has usage rate. I looked it up the other day. It's like 16%. Like he does not have the ball very much in his hands. Uh, I, think, I think the coaching staff's got a lot of work to do in the offseason. They have to dramatically change what they're running. Uh, number one, I think it'll be better for Tyrese to get off the ball more early. I think uh, uh, he'll last longer, not having to do as much, and he's certainly capable of doing it. But Siakam is one of the more gifted passing forwards in the league. Nemhard's an unbelievable passer as a as a guard. And um, I think Andrew's three-point shooting has come around like 36% or so. I haven't looked recently. Uh, but uh, that's, you know, they totally changed his shot, uh, the Pacers did. And that's just a, that's a work in progress, but in the postseason, who do you think is guarding all those guys on the other team that can really score? It won't be Tyrese. And certainly not Ben Shepard, not anytime soon. Um, I think it's going to be him. And I, I, I said Drew Holiday. And the latest guy I've been talking about is Derek White. Derek White, who I think is having a phenomenal season, all-NBA level season for the Celtics. But you never pay attention to him because of all the other stars they have. Andrew, Andrew makes winning plays. Like I said, there's only three second-year players that have a positive impact when they're on the game compared to, and, and he's one of them. And there's lots of little things he does that I promise you Rick notices. That's why he's starting. You know, overall, you know, bigger picture of this Pacers team, uh, you know, Tyrese Halliburton will be looked at as the franchise player, but yeah. also Pascal Siakam is a guy who's been all NBA before, you know, been a multiple time all-star. Do you think the Pacers are better off being able to say, hey, Siakam is our go-to scoring option on this team? Obviously, Halliburton's more of a pass-first guy, but sometimes we're seeing that Siakam's not leading the Pacers in shots. Sometimes he's second or even third, which feels kind of a little bit criminal. But do you think that the Pacers would be best being able to say, hey, Siakam, you're our go-to guy. You know, lead us in shots each night. Yeah, well, first of all, he's not a guard. And so uh, I, I've coached guys that play with people like Joel Embiid and Shaq and these great scorers. But you got to throw him the ball sometime. Now, Pascal, of course, can rebound and push. This is where I think one of the biggest changes will come in the offseason is these guys have never played with a uh, post player like Siakam. I, someone wrote an article a few months ago that, you know, 10 years ago, Siakam's a Hall of Famer because of his ability to score in the paint. He's so slinky and hard to guard. Uh, for the Pacers, he's been shooting nearly 40% from three. His free throw mm -hmm. has been struggling, but he's making threes. He didn't, he, I think it took a couple tonight and uh, uh, hadn't taken many recently, but uh, they just don't know how to utilize him. He, they're getting better at it. He's, he's sealing his guys more around the rim. You, you saw it tonight. Uh, uh, he, can, he loves to drive and kick. I noticed that when he was in Toronto a lot. And uh, I don't think they have to announce – you're the guy. I think in crunch time especially, it's read the game. So if Tyrese has, but let's say they're playing the Celtics in the second round, which would be amazing for Indiana because it means they're a four or five seed or not so amazing if they're the eight seed, you know, if they lose a seven, eight game. Um, uh, if, if Derek White or Drew is on Tyrese and he wants to try to create his own shot, that's not very smart. So they've got to go – I think they have to be more deliberate, at least a little bit, because they're very big with their randomness. Move, yes. blur screens, running around. It, it works for them. In the postseason, it won't work nearly as much. 
there's a reason why some of these guys get more money than the others. They can find ways to score or create better for teammates than guys like Neesmith and Turner and so forth. So they've got to, they've got to get actions with Tyrese and Pascal, in my opinion, with Andrew Nembhard being the third tier of playmaking on the weak side, maybe come off a, a second ball screen or a third ball screen when those first two guys have so much gravity that can really distort the defense. And then it's a matter of, hey, uh, they played, I think it was the Bulls, who have no one that can guard Siakam, except for maybe Caruso some, to be fair. He's an extraordinary defensive player, but not inside he can't. I mean, I've seen Siakam, both for the Raptors and the, pa uh, the Pacers, just kill Drew Holiday. I've never seen anyone embarrass Drew Holiday. He can't guard uh, Pascal. He probably won't in the postseason they play because he really struggles with it. Uh, and yet the Pacers didn't really look for that very much. I also think sometimes Miles Turner has advantages inside uh, and needs to learn from Pascal, just get big at the rim, and then the Pacers guards have to find them. So th the answer to your question is they've got to do a better job of recognizing where's our best matchup that can break the defense down. In the case of Siakam, he's a very willing passer. And so maybe sometimes he overpasses. Not too often, though. Uh, uh, they've got to get that gravity working. Uh, Steve Kerr says you got to get the first domino to drop. I really like that. Tyrese can get it to drop with ball screen actions or quick attacks. Uh, uh, Pascal can do it a variety of ways. And one of those two, they both need to work together a lot. And uh, and that it's gonna that'll really, I think, enhance their offense overall in the postseason. Yeah, I definitely felt like that game against Cleveland on Monday night that that was a uh... A classic example of Tyrese Halliburton trying to take over there. He did have some nice baskets, but there was a couple different times when Karis LeVert was switched on to Pascal or Miles yeah. Turner, and they didn't go to that. And he was trying to take Jared out on the perimeter, and it was like, okay, he's trying to show he's the guy instead of just taking advantage of the better matchup, which is a big versus a small in the paint. It's easier two points. So I, I do definitely understand that. And, and, and that Nets game, too, I thought one thing, one aspect of, of Pascal's game that I did like when he came back in with the second unit after getting two early fouls, you kind of saw him bringing the ball up to court more after a rebound. And that doesn't always seem to be the case when he's playing with Tyrese, but maybe more at that second unit, he feels a little bit more freedom to kind of be that guy. So how, how do you think they can kind of find that balance? Or maybe it's like you talked about playing Tyrese off ball more. Could that be another way they institute that? Yeah, well, you make a good point, too, about Tyrese's uh, disposition of, you know, I have to be the guy. And, and I'll give you, a, hopefully, a 30-second story. But I was working uh, as an analyst for ESPN when the Warriors played the Cavs the first time. So maybe 20, 2015, that might have been. Does that yep. sound right, guys? Mm -hmm. I'm an old man. So I think <laughs> 2015. Right. And Cleveland took a 2-1 lead. And towards the end of game three, and in Cleveland, after splitting it in Golden State, I texted our editor, who's now my partner, Henry Abbott, and said, the series is over. Uh, and he wrote back, oh, my God, you're predicting the Cavs an upset. I said, oh, my God, no, I'm sorry. The Warriors are going to win this from now on. He said, what are you talking about? They're down 2-1. I said, yeah, but Steph finally realized he doesn't have, have to be the man. They're blitzing. They have no other way to guard him but to really blitz him or at least hard hedge. And he kept thinking too often, not every time, that he had to be the guy. And he finally just kept hitting the short roller. Initially, it was David Lee a couple possessions. Normally, it's Draymond. And uh, I think he just realized, I don't care if I'm finals MVP. I just want to win. Well, they blew him out in game four, I think, and game five. And game six was close. And Iguodala was the MVP. It was laughable because everything revolved around stopping Steph. But Steph was not 24 years old. So we have to understand Tyrese is so new to this superstardom, which he really is. I was at, I was at the Indy airport. There's Halliburton jerseys. Nothing else. It wasn't any Reggie Miller jersey. I said Halliburton jerseys. This is a, it's a heady thing and he's 24. My twins are turning 23 in a, two months. <laughs> I promise you, my, I love my children. They are mature, smart, loving people. They are not ready to be superstars in anything. So we have to give Tyrese a chance to grow into this a little bit. But I think, I, Alex, I think you're exactly right. As he realizes, wait a second, I can just throw it on number 43 and go take my normally 42% from three rear end to some other on the court and draw two guys with me sometimes, or I can set the blur screen or the other kind of screens, like, and I can still get a good shot. And also, Nemhard is happy to pass the ball. Um, I think that when Tyrese uncovers that, which may not be this spring and summer, but I think he'll figure it out. He's super smart. And uh, he just needs to study his Steph Curry and watch that series and realize I can, I can just be like him.
because he does play a lot like him, guys. When he's rolling, he really does. And he's a better passer. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to be a bit. And then once they figure that out, again, I think, I really think their offense could be amazing. Last one for you here as we kind of wrap this up. I, I am kind of curious what you think this Pacers team ceiling could be come the postseason. Obviously, they want to avoid the play-in. Uh, I think the sixth matchup would be good to kind of avoid Boston potentially until the until the finals of the East. But uh, what do you think the ceiling is for this Pacers team? Yeah, I've been talking a lot about this. Uh, on the one hand, boy, it'd be great to see them as a four and host those first two games. Imagine I was really uh, that's the I had never been to Indiana's arena for an NBA game until last weekend. I, I think I've got five or four more arenas to visit. I've seen them all because there's a couple of new ones. Um, uh, and so imagine imagine that first game, four or five versus the Knicks or Miami or whomever. That'd be pretty cool. But even if you get by that, and we saw Cleveland last year didn't get by the five seed in New York, um, even if they did, then they have Boston. And they've done well against Boston, but I think Boston would kick their ass personally. It just They're just a much better, more experienced team. Boston's starting five is just incredible. Them and Denver, their starting fives are amazing. Um, I think that uh, they're capable of winning it, 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 anywhere – at the six spot, uh, uh, so four, five, six, they're capable of winning a round. Um, uh, I, Tyrese has to get back to being Tyrese or they'll be smoked out fast. They won't even make it that far. They'll be on mm -hmm. the play-in. They need Tyrese to play much better. Uh, and, and, and tonight, I hope, is the first step for that for him. He's made a couple of good games before, and that's okay, too. If he was just bad, 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 bad. And then it's been bad, bad, good, bad, good. Like, he's moving up, maybe. We'll see. Um uh, but no, there is their future in the next three, four years. I think they can be really dynamic. Uh, uh, Boston may break apart if they don't win a championship this year. They may decide to move Jalen after all at that point. Uh, uh, we've seen Milwaukee. I think I think they can beat Milwaukee personally. They have already before, obviously. I think the four and one against them. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I listen, there, there's such there's such a crowd. If Philly loses in Phoenix tonight. I think I think Indiana moves up a spot because I think they're they're a half game behind Philly going into the game. So by the time this, this airs, you know, the next day you'll you'll know. Um, yeah, I think that uh, they're probably a one series and done team. Uh, uh, the postseason experience does matter in the sense of not necessarily just making mistakes, but dealing with emotions. I don't. Mm -hmm. I think veterans make mistakes all the time, guys. There's no there's no such thing as a rookie mistake. They're just mistakes, but the t intensity and emotion and stress take some time to get used to. I speak it as a parent, the way my kids first got sick was a lot more stressful than the second or third or fourth time. Uh, and postseason is kind of similar. It's just hard to deal with. You've never done it before. And that kind of intensity, the crowds in the regular season are so average compared to the postseason. So uh, I think the Pacers, I, I cover the whole league. Uh, they're one of the teams that are, that I think they're the most fun team to watch in league pass when they were rolling. I think that's going to be in their future again. They'll be one of those teams like OKC that's really got a chance to be special in the next four or five, four or five years or so. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be a fun ride to kind of see how those how this team grows in the next couple of years. And this is just kind of phase one of, of what they're trying to get to. But, Coach, we want to thank you so much for your time, for joining us today, and we'd love to get you back on here you know, during the offseason for sure to kind of talk about this team in the future. You gave us a lot of good nuggets there about how they could go about – trying to rebuild this team and just continue to try to grow it. But uh, I know you got a lot of stuff going on, so I want to let you uh, spend this time now to kind of talk about what you have going on and maybe promote anything you'd like to promote. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be quick. So uh, every week we do two podcasts at truehoop.com, and we're a Substack newsletter. Uh, we write normally two articles a week at minimum. Henry Abbott covers super smart stuff around basketball, and I just do basic analysis of the game as best I can. Sometimes the game, sometimes players, sometimes trends, that kind of thing. But um, uh, uh, that's what we do every week at True Hoop. And then uh, we started a business called the Pro Training Center, which is based on what I do with my NBA players, uh, PTC recruiting, where if you've got a, right now we're just doing guys in high school that you think can play in college, we help evaluate their, their projection for that. If we think they can play in college, we assist you in finding a scholarship opportunity. Uh, we've had a ton of really great success stories in the, the year we've been doing this. And then we also have players in the transfer portal. Uh, uh, I think there's our, I think they're expecting 4,000 players in the transfer portal. We, we had 
Four guys last year, we helped three of them transfer, one we told them to stay. It worked out for all of them very well, we're happy to say. And uh, this year we'll probably take a lot more. So if you have a, right now, again, just the sun and just basketball, eventually we'll probably do all the women's sports and, and all the guys' sports that are team oriented. But right now we're just focused on men's hoops. So uh, you can find me on, uh, really the best way to contact me is uh, uh, Pro Training Center, you know, PTC-Recruiting on Twitter. Um, and, and they can find your show and ask to get my number too if they want. Yeah, uh, we can talk about that. But I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Uh, but the Pacers is one of the teams I enjoy watching a lot. Hey, we're happy to hear that. We're really happy to have you back on. Like, like Alex said, awesome insight, Coach. We look forward to having that opportunity to do it again. Great. Be, be well, guys.